Hi everybody, welcome to the first of the recorded class sessions that you'll be watching this semester. The way these are going to work is I'm going to step through the material that we'll cover together in class, but um, you need to watch each one of these before the corresponding day of class. So that way you come with a basic understanding of the material before we discuss it together. Um, I started doing this about seven or eight years ago and it resulted in, in a permanent bump up in the average test scores. And so it's a great way to help you learn. You'll also be able to come back and watch these later as you're preparing for exams. Um, and if they become relevant to you later professionally, they will be a resource to you as well. I leave them up on YouTube so that um, pretty much anybody can watch them whenever they want. Although they may not watch this session. I'm not sure how often nonprofit history is relevant to your job, <laughs> but it is important. It's important to learn, and I think you'll actually be surprised by some of the things you learn about the history of nonprofits in the United States. It's going to spark some fascinating discussion that we're going to have together in class. At the beginning of each of these class sessions, I'm going to provide you with a list of goals. Um, these are the things that I want to make sure you learn. They're learning outcomes, essentially. And what I want you to do with each one of these is uh, hang on to them. You'll notice that they're also copied word for word into the study guide so that they're there for when you prepare for exams. So the goals from this class session, I want you to learn and understand Lester Salomon's definition of nonprofit organizations. This is a more robust and thorough definition than the one I gave on the first day of class. I want you to understand and explain the importance of two things. The first one is the Elizabethan Statute of Charitable Uses, and the other one is a Supreme Court case called Dartmouth v. Woodward. And then finally, I want you to be able to understand and identify the critical changes of each major period in nonprofit history as I define them. So let's start by talking about Lester Salomon's definition. Um, this is the way that nonprofits look today. If you remember on the first day of class, I gave you a definition that I said covered over 90% of nonprofits. This is a definition that covers 100% of them. And so uh, I'm just going to step through each of them quickly, and then we're going to apply this framework to nonprofits as they've morphed and changed throughout the history of the United States. Nonprofits are formal organizations. That means they're incorporated as entities, legal entities. Um, nonprofit distributing, we talked about this idea already, it means that there are no owners that you can give excess profit, that you can give excess revenue to. Um, these are private, meaning non governmental. Um, they are self governing, meaning that they determine their own fate and strategy and so forth. They're voluntary, meaning that nobody compels them to exist. They exist because certain people choose to make them exist. And finally, they operate for a public benefit. I want you to notice that there's something missing from Salomon's definition, which is that they are tax exempt. Um, that's t not actually a technical requirement to be considered a nonprofit. It's definitely a, a perk of being a nonprofit, but not a requirement to be considered a nonprofit. And that's something we're going to learn more together this semester. So I hope those six six elements of, of Salomon's definition are clear, but they haven't always been that way. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look back at American history, starting with the British colonial period, and work our way forward and kind of talk about the way nonprofits have changed during each of these six periods. So starting with the British colonial period, um, I want to draw attention first to something called the Elizabethan Statute of Charitable Uses. So this was passed into law in the United Kingdom in 1601. So this predates the United States um, as a country. Um, and what happened with this is this was the first time in history that special tax treatment was given to charitable purposes, meaning that the law actually, this is the first time the law ever defined what's charitable. Um, and so if you were a, a wealthy landowner and you dedicated some of your resources to this kind of, these the activities in this list, then you, it, what it meant is that it would diminish your tax burden. And so, um, Highlighting some of the interesting categories here, um, we have the relief of aged, impotent, and poor people, the maintenance of sick and maimed soldiers and, and mariners, schools of learning, 
including universities, the repair of uh, public works like bridges, ports, havens, causeways, churches, sea banks, and highways. Um, education and performance specifically of orphans was considered a charitable purpose. Um, houses of correction, meaning prisons. Um, the marriages of poor maids was a category of charitable activity back then. And then finally, providing for or helping uh, young tradesmen and handicraftsmen, those who were apprenticing and didn't have much income at the time. Uh, it's interesting to look at these categories and see how many of them have carried forward uh, into modern day definitions of charities and how many we've left behind. This is something we'll talk about together in class. If you, if you look at the British colonial period and we use Salomon's definition as a lens we see some interesting things about how nonprofits back then were different. Um, back then, the majority of nonprofit activity happened through churches. There wasn't much non-governmental charitable work except what happened through churches, and churches were primarily providing the things that we typically think of nonprofit besides religion. Uh, churches were primar primarily providing, providing help and care for the poor, and they were also providing education like schools. Um, this was true in the colonies, not just in the UK. Um, in fact, what most people don't know is that back then about half of the colonies had um, official state religions that drew tax revenue from the public. And for that reason, there was quite a bit of government control over nonprofit activity um, through churches, government controlling the nonprofit activity through the churches, uh, in, ca in many cases, the official churches of the, of the colony. And uh, so what that meant is that they were also mostly tax-supported entities. They drew a lot of their revenue from taxes. Um, there was a lot of government control of nonprofits, um, mostly coming down from the fact that there was a king and um, that, that uh, sort of oversaw all sorts of activities like this. Um, so most of it was done in the, in the name of the crown um, in addition to the churches. These were still voluntary in the sense that the government never compelled anybody to participate in these things. Um, but as I said earlier, the primary public benefit that we saw back then, and you can see reflected in the Elizabethan statute of charitable uses, was the importance of poverty and education. Um, when the American Revolution happened and we established a separate government, two big changes occurred in this new republic period as far as nonprofits are concerned. The first was the separation of church and state. Uh, the resulting effect of that was a whole bunch of churches that had benefited from uh, state tax revenue or colonial tax revenue now no longer benefited from that to support their activities. Um, and then the other big change we saw during that time period was the Supreme Court case of Dartmouth v. Woodward. Now, this was historically really critical to the way nonprofits work. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in greater detail in class, um, but the essence of it is that case resulted in a guarantee that the nonprofit sector could operate independent of government control. And I'll tell you the story about, about the case, where it came from. It had to do with Dartmouth College, which had been originally chartered by the King of England, uh, then became part of New Hampshire. It then was under the brief control of the New Hampshire state government, um, but it sued for essentially its independence from government control. The Dartmouth College did. And the case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was argued by Daniel Webster, um, who's one of the most famous attorneys in American history. I'll tell you more about what he said and, and, and the case he made. But the important thing to remember about this case is that this was the first time that, uh, the, the, rather not the first time, this was one of the most important rulings that allowed for separate private nonprofit activity, uh, something we'll explore more together in class. So looking at the New Republic period, um, the formal organization of nonprofits uh, shifted away from churches and into, into independent corporations that were chartered under the laws of each individual state. And this is a concept we talked about already on the first day of class. So that meant they were private, not government controlled. But back then, getting a state charter was, it was an arbitrary process. It wasn't a right guaranteed to everybody if the government didn't, if the state government didn't like you, that you wouldn't give you a charter. You had no right or claim on it. And so typically what it meant is you had to be a white landowner 
um, in order to be eligible to actually set up a, a nonprofit corporation back then. Um, because the government tax revenue dried up during this time period, uh, uh, a lot of nonprofit activity had to start being funded through private sponsorship. Um, and as a result of shifting to corporations, the way that they govern themselves was through boards of directors, a concept that we'll explore more in our class session 1.5. Uh, as always, they're voluntary. Nobody's compelling anybody to set up these nonprofits. Um, and you can see that the primary public benefits that were pursued for nonprofits back then was still poverty and education. If we move on to the remainder of the 19th century, we see some interesting changes. One of them is that charitable purposes were expanded under the law to begin to include arts and museums. Uh, this is a, a portrait of someone named James Smithson, who is the benefactor of the Smithsonian Institute. It's an interesting story about him that we'll tell, but uh, the, the quick version of it is that the Smithsonian Institute was originally founded because James Smithson didn't have any descendants who were eligible to inherit his wealth. And so when he died, and it actually had to do with a nephew who didn't have any kids before he died. And so, <clears throat> um, and so this, uh, this nephew having died without children before James Smithson died meant that Smithson had no natural heirs to pass his wealth to. And so he went to the United States and we're going to talk about that. Um, and that's where the Smithsonian Institute came from. Another thing that's interesting about this time period is an observation that came from Alexis de Tocqueville, who's a French author, uh, traveled the United States during this time period and made multiple observations about, about democracy in America. That was the title of, of his work. And, and he had this interesting thing to say about American culture as it relates to public benefit and, and activities like that. He said, I've seen Americans make great and real sacrifices to the public welfare. And I've noticed a hundred instances in which they hardly ever failed to lend faithful support to one another. We're going to talk about this idea in class together and throughout the semester, this idea that nonprofits are a critical part of American democracy. And we're going to explore that concept. It's actually pretty critical um, to understand because without nonprofits, the, the nature of democracy in the United States would change dramatically. So moving on to the 19th century description, using Salomon's definition, there was during the 19th century, the remainder of the 19th century, a religious resurgence. And, uh, you know, this we know from uh, Latter-day Saint church history, for example, where um, Joseph Smith uh, first encountered religion in a burned out district, which meant uh, a, a part of the country that was uh, essentially overrun with religious activity. Um, so churches started taking up more of the of the nonprofit activity in the United States again during that time period, um, because Americans started becoming more religious than they had been before. Um, arbitrary state charter was still arbitrary. Income sources shifted from private sponsorship to also include earned income. Uh, nonprofits started charging for goods and services, primarily in the form of tuition. Uh, nonprofit hospitals started charging for their uh, care that they provided and so forth. The other things stay the same with the exception of public benefit, where, as I said, uh, we now, in, into that definition of public benefit, we add arts and museums. As we move on to the 20th century, um, for the first slightly more than half of the 20th century, we saw three important changes take place. The most important of which being the federal income tax. Um, in 1913, when the original version of the federal income tax was passed, tax or nonprofit corporations were provided tax exemptions. So as corporations, they wouldn't have to pay an income tax the way regular corporations do. The other change that happened is four years later, uh, the federal government established a deduction for donations, meaning that when you, and you guys know this, when you don't make a donation, uh, to a nonprofit, you don't have to pay income tax on that donation. And that was a law passed first in 1917. Um, and then finally, uh, because of the tax code and the way the law was written around nonprofits and what was considered a public, a public benefit, uh, the law included scientific research um, into that. And so research activity of universities um, or other private organizations uh, were 
included into the definition of what makes something a nonprofit. So looking at the changes during this time period, corporations continue to be the dominant uh, form of nonprofit activity, but there was a, a rise of charitable trusts during this time period, and that had mostly to do with the robber, baron, robber barons like Rockefeller and Carnegie, people who became incredibly wealthy and dedicated their wealth to charitable causes. Back then, they actually did it through charitable trusts, and we're going to talk about trusts more in Class Session 1.4. One of the other changes you saw during this time period is that getting a charter from the state to set up your nonprofit became more broadly available. Um, still, idiosyncrasies that were that made it more difficult for some people versus others. Um, obviously, if you lived in certain parts of the country, for example, and you were black, uh, you might be turned down for a nonprofit charter. Um, the other change, like we talked about, is that public benefit included scientific research. As we move on from the 60s uh, through the remainder of the 20th century, we see four important changes that took place. One is that from 1960 to 1980, there was a huge increase in federal funding for nonprofit activity, where before the New Deal in the 1940s meant government carried out a bunch of this activity. There was a shift where the federal government instead started offering big grants to nonprofits that would carry out the same kind of activity. And so there's a, a, a spike of growth in federal funding that switched in the 80s to earned income. And under the Reagan administration, a bunch of money that went out to nonprofits through the form of government grants instead went out in the form of contracts and payments, like reimbursements for, for, for medical expenses, for example. So that um, nonprofits started charging for goods and services and whether it was individuals or the government that was paying for those goods and services, the point it was, it was more of a contractual relationship, an exchange of goods and services rather than um, the result of a grant. With all this new money that came into the sector, this also was a period of explosive growth and the nonprofit sector grew like crazy and I'll show you some charts in the next slide that illustrate that. And then we also saw during this time period an increasing secularization of the nonprofit sector, meaning that, that most of the growth in the sector came in the form of non-religious organizations rather than churches. Here's an example of how fast the nonprofit sector has grown. And so this is an index-based chart, so we're just really tracking relative growth. The numbers on the y-axis are just an index number, so they don't mean anything unless you compare them against each other. And what you can see is that the, the chart with the boxes uh, involved, or sorry, the line with the boxes is the growth of the nonprofit sector relative to the overall U.S. economy. And so we have the growth of the economy moving at a pretty steady but increasing pace. You can see the nonprofit sector started growing incredibly quickly. Now this happened in spite of the fact that all throughout the, that same time period, donations to charity didn't change that much. Now this chart looks like it changed a lot because we're sort of zoomed in on it, but if you'll notice the scale on the y axis on the on the y axis, we're really only operating between one and a half to two and a half percent of personal income. Meaning that for the average American during this time period that spans all the way back to the nineteen twenties through the nineteen nineties that that people only gave around two percent of their personal income. A year. That number has stayed incredibly stable. In fact, you're going to hear me repeat this multiple times during the semester, but that does not change. And for as long as we've tracked it, giving is around 2% of income in the United States. So what happened during the 1960s to the present? Uh, there was a shift back away from trusts and more toward corporations. We had a change. We're now charter. getting a charter to start a nonprofit is incredibly simple. Um, income sources shifted so that now nonprofits are relying mostly on earned income, like we talked about on the first day of class, and public benefit changed to the seven IRS categories that we talked about on the first day of class as well. So what's been happening since 2000? It really is defined by one dominant change, which is a change where nonprofits are becoming more businesslike and businesses are becoming more like nonprofits. Cotopaxi, a Utah company that makes outdoor gear, is a great example of this. Um, and we're going to talk about what B corporations are and all that kind of stuff as the, as, as this class unit goes on as, as sorry, we're going to talk about it on session 1.4. We're going to talk about B corporations. Uh, 
Um, but the essence of what I wanted to get from this is that from the 2000s on, what we've seen is blending or overlap between what nonprofits and for-profits have traditionally done where nonprofits are acting more and more like businesses, but also businesses are acting more and more like nonprofits and operating not just for a return to shareholders, but also to impact the world in a positive way. And that's really the last thing that we're gonna talk about as far as changes go. So sector blending is the interesting thing that's happening in the formal organization side, but everything else is as it was uh, from the 1960s through the 2000s. So what do we learn? Um, what, what we're going to answer this question together, actually, because I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to talk about the balance of the roles between nonprofits and government, how important the religious history of nonprofits is today, why corporations are so important as a, as an operation form for the way nonprofit activity happens. We're going to talk about whether or not the definition of charitable purpose is, it encapsulates what it needs to. And we're going to talk about why it is we feel a need to treat nonprofit money differently um, and why that's such a such an important aspect of the way we handle nonprofits. So that's class session 1.2, and I'll see you all in class. Thank you.